Howard Zinn died three years ago this week. When he died at the age of 87, the press reported his death describing him as the leftist historian. I find it strange that he was labeled that way. There may be left and right perspectives, but there are not left and right truths. Howard Zinn told us some truths about historical events, which most of us didn't know, which mostly didn't make it into American history books, and are not generally part of the mm, self-esteem of America. But that doesn't make it leftist just because he told us what we maybe didn't want to hear. Things which it seems more politic not to mention often show up in Zen's books, like the fact that churches all across America were fascinated by the story of Helen Keller, the little girl who couldn't see, who couldn't speak, who couldn't hear, who was taught how to read and how to speak. And they were addicted to Helen Keller's stories until, and this is what no one ever told me in school, once Helen Keller began to read Braille and discovered how much violence and oppression and poverty that there is in the world, that Helen Keller became an outspoken advocate for a rad radical socialist reform of the world, particularly in America. And that's when American churches began to say, well, you really can't pay much attention to a blind, deaf, dumb girl now, can you? <laughs> that's not leftist. It's just a fact that when she became informed, she became a radical socialist. You can like Helen Keller or you cannot like Helen Keller. But the fact is that she became an outspoken advocate for a radical reform in the economy of America to eradicate poverty. It's a truth that you have to deal with, like it or not. Zen's recounting of the history of the United States racial relationships uh, address a number of uncomfortable facts, almost as a throwaway. In one of the chapters, he just mentions the fact that Dr. Charles Drew developed the Red Cross's blood bank system. He was an African-American physician for whom Drew Medical School is named. But Drew was fired when he suggested that there was no reason to bank white people's blood separate from black people's blood, that you typed blood, but race had nothing to do with it. But that was not something that white America was willing to hear. Drew was a wonderful researcher, a brilliant physician, but he had the misfortune of being black and telling white people that what's underneath our skin is pretty much the same. Zen made a profession out of telling the unvarnished truth, and as a result, he was denied tenure at universities where he worked, he was fired, he was marginalized, he was labeled, and largely ignored in academic circles during most of his lifetime. John quotes Jesus as saying that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, but the popular addition to that saying is that before the truth sets you free, it's going to make you very, very angry. People get very angry when they're told that their worldview is no longer correct. We have a rather on-again, off-again relationship with the truth, both as Christians and as Americans. There are things that the church doesn't want to own up to. There are things that the church taught us to believe as children that we would only believe if it was hammered into us when we were very vulnerable and told that if we didn't continue to believe those things, that the very good and loving Lord God Almighty will burn you up like a piece of bacon for all eternity if you dare to not believe some of these things that are clearly not believable. There are things, though, that as Americans that we would just rather not know. We would rather not think about how wealth in America was generated by the genocide of American Indians, by the theft of land, by child labor, by slavery. Many of us have objected to the fact that there were never casualty records kept on the number of Iraqis and Afghanis killed in our wars in the Middle East. 
We count the deaths of American soldiers, but reliable information, even about contract labor, which I don't even know, and this is something that I'm interested in knowing, is very difficult to find out, the number of uniformed service person, personnel who die, we can get those numbers, but the numbers of contractors that we hire out of America, that, that we send over there to work, the number of them that have died, that's very hard to find. We don't release that information because we're not obligated to. But we don't even count the numbers of deaths of Afghanis and Iraqis. And when other news agencies do, Al Jazeera, for example, when they report estimates of casualties, we say, oh, well, that's Al Jazeera. Well, they're more reliable than we are because we're not talking about it at all. We act as if they are somehow subhuman and not worthy of counting even the bodies. We have an unconscious belief that if we do not know the facts, that the facts are not real. It isn't real until we acknowledge it as true. I was reading an article in the Christian Century several years ago during the first Gulf War, and I came on this quote, and it was so bizarre that I copied it down into a notebook and have kept that note with me for years because this is literally what he said. A, a columnist wrote, defending U.S. military censors' refusal to release the video footage showing Iraqi soldiers being cut in half by cannon fire from helicopters. A Pentagon senior official said, if we let people see that kind of thing, there would never again be any war. <laughs> if we let people see the video of what we're actually doing, Americans would never again support another war. You see, there are truths that if you utter them, if you say them out loud, you can lose your job. You can lose your credibility. You can lose your tenure. You could lose huge military contracts. You can make people very angry. You could make Americans feel very embarrassed. In the current gun control debate, you, you can be cast as a liberal for just stating the numerical facts. A hundred thousand Americans are shot every year. A hundred thousand. 30,000 of them die. Now, that's not liberal. That's not conservative. That's math. And if you begin to say that math is liberal, then where are you really going with that? I think that gun owners and gun advocates need to join the mathematical conversation about what could we do to reduce that number. But if you have 30,000 deaths in America and you can count the deaths, the gun deaths in Japan on the fingers of your hands, then clearly we've got a problem. And it's not a conservative problem or a, a, a liberal problem. It's 30,000 deaths. That's 9-11 happening 10 times a year. And we keep acting like we can't do anything about it. It isn't happening in other uh, uh, advanced uh, industrial nations. It's happening here. What can we do? Luke tells us a very brief encapsulated version of a time that Jesus went back to his hometown to preach after he had become something of a rising superstar in the Galilee. The scene moves very quickly from everyone being so impressed with him that they were breathlessly praising him to this scene that we see today where the entire congregation rises up and pushes him out to a cliff to throw him off the cliff. I've preached sermons like that. I, I understand what that's like. But, but his, his own family members, his friends, his school chums, he said something that made them all want to kill him instantaneously. So what set them off? Well, he had been talking to them about liberation, about healing, about preaching good news to the poor. So far, so good. In fact, it was kind of a political speech that was one of those a chicken in every pot kind of speeches. It's just that after he said it, he clarified himself, saying, well, actually, the chicken won't be in your pot. The chicken will be in your neighbor's pot your neighbor who's not a member of this congregation, who, uh, who's a member of another religion, who's 
a different race from you, who speaks a different language. Preachers have for centuries secured their salaries and their pensions by telling straight people that gay people are bad and telling married people that divorced people are bad and telling Christians that Muslims and Jews are bad and telling Americans that Germans and Japanese and Vietnamese and Russians and Iraqis are bad. Religion often takes the corporate worldview. The Supreme Court has told us that corporations are people, but sometimes corporations are churches. Sometimes they just say what their consumers want to hear. I, I've told this story several times, but forgive me, I'll, I'll use it again after today. When Sheryl Crow released her very popular self-titled item uh, uh, album, CD, uh, one of the songs on it was Love is a Good Thing, and one of the lyrics in the song says, Watch out, sister, watch out, brother, watch our children as they kill each other with a gun they bought at Walmart discount stores. So Walmart executives in Bentonville get together to discuss the fact that Sheryl Crow was calling them out on the fact that in their more than 2,000 stores across the United States, in the toy department, they sell lethal weapons. Faced with that fact, they knew they had to do something. And what they did was they decided not to sell Sheryl Crow CDs because Sheryl Crow CDs are dangerous to gun, to gun sales. So if you deny it, if you stick your head in the sand, if you pretend it isn't true, then it can't really be true. The Danish uh, philosopher Soren Kierkegaard was very critical of the irrelevance of the church of his day, and he once quipped, in our generation, Christians do not stop with faith. They do not stop with the miracle of faith of turning water into wine. It goes farther. This generation turns wine into water. Now, isn't that really the church as we have experienced it so often? The church has historically treated us like we were brain damaged. They've treated us like we were gullible children by filling our heads with stories of magic and superstition and masking the truths of our real existence by making certain that nothing was ever said from the pulpit that made you uncomfortable. When people tell me that they are visiting here looking for a church they feel comfortable in, I tell them to keep looking because if you feel comfortable here, then I'm not doing my job. The church of, of today has taken the position of turning the very potent, powerful, life-changing, earth-shattering truths that Jesus utters and turned them into filtered water. As we are gathered here in our church this morning for the first time in our history, our elementary age children are in a class in our newly opened annex. There was a time in our church's history when we thought we might turn out to be a boutique church. We thought about even just meeting on Thursday nights or Saturday afternoons so that people could go to their regular church and get all the fall de roll that churches normally do and just come here as just sort of, you know, a group of people who hungered for intellectual honesty and an academic approach to religion. We're not a part of a denomination. There are not many other churches like ours anywhere that we know of. But we sought out one another because we know that we don't fit in. We just don't fit in to the rest of the religious world that prefers to not know the facts, that would rather wallow in superstition and lies and half-truths than to actually do the hard work of changing the world. Sometime back, we realized that it was not enough for us to just find some friends who also don't fit in. We realized that it was increasingly important to make sure that our children don't fit in either. <laughs> in part, we want to protect our children from being exposed to the dishonest mythology of either magical Christianity or American exceptionalism. But the bigger issue for me is that the next generation will also need its prophets. Howard Zinn is dead. Marcus Borg, John Spong, John, John Dominic Crossan, and Karen Armstrong have all reached retirement age. And not to put 
the two of us in that category necessarily, but Roger Ray and David Trobish are in our 50s. We're not that far behind. It is therefore our task to teach our children to love the truth as much as we do, not to perpetuate this congregation. That's been one of the strangest myths I hear repeated by people in churches. They say all the time, well, the children are the future of our church. You all aren't going to the church you grew up in. Most people in this uh, century will never continue to go to the church that they grew up in. We move away. We get jobs out of state. We marry. We move. It's not the future of this church. We're not establishing an education program for this church. We're, ab we're establishing an education program for the future, for the church with a capital C, for the next generation. Because someone has to be the Howard Zinn who will tell the truth in the 21st century. Someone has to be the John Spong who writes books about how the church has to get honest and tell the truth in the 21st century. Honestly, I truly wish that I was 36 years old instead of 56 years old. I wish I could believe that I had another 40 years to preach and to nurture the progressive Christian movement. But reality is... You all might put up with me for another 10 or 15 years. I hope you will. But my time is limited. So the next generation of prophets are about 100 yards east of us right now in a room full of young people that need to learn to not be scared to tell the truth to power and to be able to tell the difference between what is real and what is magic and what is honest and what is a lie. Let's make sure, then, that we don't fail them. Between now and the time that I retire, I'm going to try very hard to live in a way so that they tell stories about me when I'm not around anymore. And I hope you will, too. You've been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.